To 51. We're continuing the uh, Christmas series, in fact, uh, the coming of Jesus in uh, jo John chapter 1. Let's read responsively these verses from the Word of God. <coughs> the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? Let's read together. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, have you been skiing? Have you ever been to a ski resort? You know, I have two years ago. I remember vividly, it uh, was the first time my family went skiing and learned, I learned how to ski. Uh, it was kind of fun because I learned with the uh, skis uh, set on your feet, you can't walk up a hill, right? So you have to walk sideways like a crab <laughs> to climb up a little slope. And uh, in order for you to stop, to slow down and stop, you have to make this triangular shape with your feet. They call it the pizza. So, you know, I was practicing the pizza all morning long, trying to, you know, get up a little slope and ride and practice my skills. And I enjoyed it. It was kind of fun. Uh, in the afternoon, you know, um, you know, the lesson was done, so we were on our own. And uh, I, tried to, I tried to ski, but uh, my legs, they all lost their strength. I had, waste, I had, you know, so focused on not falling down that I was so tired, I couldn't uh, really enjoy myself. And the heat, the sun was so hot. I took off my jacket and it's so cold. Uh, I put it back on, I'm sweating. And, you know, the sun is so, so warm and the wind is so cold. And I had a, you know, hard time. But the end, day was over. The next day, you know, I felt uh, all the body ache all over my body as if uh, I had been, you know, beat up by a previous day. My body was sore all over and uh, I was no condition in to get up. And there's, there was only one conclusion that I could come to after that skiing experience, my first time skiing in my life. I said to myself and to my wife too, we will never go skiing again in my life. Well, last week we went skiing. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, uh, we went, but uh, we had a very strong motivation to go back. And it was the kids. As, but the kids wanted to, you know, that's always the excuse. The kids wanted to go back. And so we went to the ski resort. I found myself sitting there at the lodge. Uh, you know, we didn't ski because I learned my lesson. And uh, the kids, uh, we had, they had a great time. And uh, we sacrificed ourselves and our time and our money to please the kids. You know, if we think there's something, if something is worth it and there's enough motivation, we challenge ourselves to do things that we don't want to do. When something, we experience something and we find that this is not for me, this is too challenging, it's, uh, the co it's too costly for us, we tend to give up and we tend to not look back anymore until there is a strong enough motivation that flips that decision to actually go ahead and do it regardless of the consequences. And for me, that, was, that motivation were my beloved kids, to please them. 
I believe uh, our faith, our Christian life is somewhat like, somewhat like skiing as well. For some of you, there were uh, some of you who were, were the, the uh, ski, who were on the ski of faith for the first time in your life as you went on a mission trip this year. There are those who got onto the, the slow, ski slope of faith as you served at the church for the first time in your life. Maybe it was your first time doing evangelism. It was your first time doing all these uh, stunts with uh, skis of faith. Some people have been skiing, spiritually speaking, uh, speaking, skiing for their entire lives, and they're pretty good at it. They are uh, doing, going on the little challenging courses and are able to navigate through the difficult slopes. But regardless where your spiritual level, our spiritual level, Christian level uh, is, one thing is for sure, and it, it is all the same for us. It is the fact that we must not give up skiing this journey of faith. Because it's not just a ski, right? Like it's a recreational, it's, you know, it's an optional thing. Our life of faith is a focusing on the eternal life. And it is a salvation that we must achieve throughout our lives as we focus our eyes on the God we love. It is not a optional thing that we can just avoid. It is a lifetime journey with God. We need to learn how to ski in faith, uh, ski in faith in order not to stumble over the, the rock of the stone of sin. We need to learn how to ski in faith in order to leap over the lake of despair sometimes. And it, with all things, it's difficult. It's a narrow path, narrow road, just like Jesus said. Only when we have the right motivation to continue on this life of faith, this journey of faith, can we continue on following Jesus Christ into the new year, 2022. And so the question for this morning from the passage of scripture we, we're read, we read this morning is how to keep following Jesus next year? How can we keep up this journey of faith? This, uh, so to speak, journey of faith feels like skiing sometimes. We stumble and fall and we're bruised and we feel like I don't, never want to go back and follow Jesus again. But what keeps us going, following Jesus way into the next year? And uh, using the ski analogy a little bit more, I like to suggest two ski poles, so to speak, so to speak, two ski poles that we can lean on, depend on, in order to keep following Jesus way into 2020, 2020, not 22, right? 2020. And there are two ski poles. The first is this: we must hold on to the confession of our faith. Can we say it together? Hold on to the confession of our faith. Today's story, we find a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel who made a confession of faith. He was a, uh, became a disciple of Jesus and this confession of faith helped him to follow Jesus in his life. Last week we saw John the Baptist. He's set the stage for Jesus. He's saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He says, this is the Son of God. So he's like putting the spotlight on this young man, Jesus of Nazareth. And as a result, people start to follow him. He already had two followers, now a third. His name was Philip. And Jesus, when he encountered Philip, he says, come follow me. So Philip began to follow Jesus. And for Philip, the very first thing, the most natural thing for him to do was to go to his best friend forever, right, Nathaniel. So, see, you see, um, they were from uh, Bethsaida, this small town called Bethsaida. And we can imagine that they probably talked about uh, a lot of, uh, you know, news and the religion of the time and how things are going. They were concerned for the time. They were, in fact, god fears. They were thirsty for the kingdom of God to come down on this earth. They were waiting for the Messiah, Messiah, to come. Because... There, at the end of their conversation, Philip and Nathaniel always thought, talked about how they were oppressed by this Roman government, how they were being overly taxed, how there was oppression and unfair treating uh, in the Jewish people. And so they were waiting and eagerly studying the scripture. They were conversing with one another. 
They were, in fact, uh, so to speak, Messiah maniacs. And when Philip, he discovered this guy, could this be the one? The first reaction was to go to his best friend, Nathaniel, and say, I've met somebody. I met him. And this is how he describes him. He says, uh, this might be the person that's described by Moses in his writings. It, it probably is the one also prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. This excited the heart of Nathaniel when he heard this. His eyes got bigger and he was just uh, wanted no more. So Philip, what is his name? And Philip says to Nathaniel, he is the son of Joseph, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And then Nathaniel kind of uh, had this doubt in his heart. Nazareth? Really? They were maniacs, right? They know where the Messiah would come. He would be uh, from the tribe of Judah, from the south, not up here, not here where there's nothing but uh, animals and farming. He's from Nazareth? Really? And so Philip, he, he was not as resourceful in his knowledge, so all he could say was, hey, just come see. Come see what I'm talking about. And so that's how Nathaniel was to encounter Jesus for the first time. Nathaniel and Philip were probably coming together from a distance to Jesus. And when Jesus came close to them, Jesus praised Nathaniel. And he says, this is a true Israelite. There is nothing guile. There is no deceit in this person's heart. So, you know, Nathaniel hearing this from a total stranger, kind of weird, but it uh, didn't feel too bad, right? But he wanted to make sure. And he said this question to Jesus. So, do you know me? And uh, this is what Jesus said. He said, before Philip ever called you, I saw you under the fig tree. When Nathaniel heard this, his whole heart was electrified. He was trembling because this meant something dear to him. For us, when we hear this sentence, oh, I guess Jesus saw him just sitting there on under a tree. But this sentence was loaded with a lot of meaning for Nathaniel. It was a statement that was, went straight to his heart. Because you see, when the Jewish people talk about the fig tree, being under the fig tree, that's what the Jewish rabbis did. That's what religious people, that's what pious people of God did. They sat under this place, their place of worship. Maybe a fig tree. It could be a fig tree, literal fig tree. It could be their home. Or maybe in Jesus' terms, it could be your prayer closet. It was your private place where you talk to God, where you pray to God, where you read the scripture, where you are touched by him. And for Jesus to say that I saw you under your fig tree, Nathaniel knew that Jesus was a person of supernatural origin. He knew that he had to come from God. Jesus seemed to know the very private life of Nathaniel. This Nathaniel who was so pure in his heart, he was so soft. He responded with, to this one sentence of Jesus and he, it was enough for him to trust and believe in this Jesus as a person sent by God. It was a time, a, a, a moment when Nathaniel's heart was truly touched by God. When we meet somebody, when you and I meet somebody for the first time, but we discover that that person had known you for a while, maybe they know your dad or parents, they've seen you when you're small, we tend to soften our hearts and open ourselves to that person, right? And Nathaniel felt that way. He felt like, this person knows me. He sees me. He is from God. And he was, it was enough for him to open his heart to this Jesus. In fact, the Bible talks about many people of faith that had similar experiences when they met God for the first time and they realized that this person, this God, knows everything about them. They suddenly soften up. They are undone, so to speak, and are receptive. They are touched by God. I recall two people, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. One is from uh, New Test Old Testament, the Moses, the very person that's written here in today's passage. When Moses was in the Midian desert wilderness, he was a shepherd. He was tending a sheep. He was a nobody. But then he saw this bush that was burning but wasn't really burning up. So he went near to, to observe what's going on. And then he heard this voice, Moses, Moses. 
when he heard his name being called from this bush, he was so scared. And, he, and, and this bush continued to talk to him. It was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of his ancestors. This person knew him, his origin, his birth. And this God was telling him, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard the prayers of my people. When Moses realized this God, this person who he had met for the first time, knew his before, his present, and he knew he knows his people, Moses was totally undone. He was ready to say yes to the calling of bringing his people out of Egypt. Also, we remember Paul or Saul, right? When he was on the way to Damascus, and he was suddenly encountered by this bright light, in the light, there was a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is painful for you to kick the gourds. It is painful for you to kick the very thing that is pointy and sharp. It's only going to hurt you. And at that moment, when he heard his name being called by this stranger in the light, he was undone. Because not only he knew his, his, uh, his name, but he knew what was going through the deep heart of Saul. Because you see, Saul was going to Damascus to persecute and kill Christians to get rid of this sect, this uh, cult that was going around, he thought. But deep in his heart, he knew something was wrong. He was hurting. When he heard Jesus, way long time ago, when he heard Jesus teaching, he was hurt. There was a, a part of him that he wanted to repent. When he, a couple of days ago, he, was, he witnessed the uh, martyrdom of Stephen. He was there. He affirmed that this person should die because he's teaching Jesus. But in his heart, there was this hurt. He knew something was not right. And this person who showed up in the light says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is so burdensome, painful for you to kick the gourds. When Saul realized that this person knew him so well, Saul was undone. He had to fall to the ground and he became a follower of Jesus Christ. When we, Nathaniel had an experience like this. He realized, although it was a very short encounter, with his pure heart, his, his clean heart, he realized that he was in front of a man of God. He was undone and he was willing to follow Jesus. When I was a bit younger, I had a similar experience of being undone. You know, when I was a teenager, being high school, you have those moments when you, you know, want to ask God, are you there? Are you really listening to my prayers? You have all these philosophical questions about life, about your future, about good and evil, the existence of, you know, God and all, all of that. I was going through that period in my life. One day I was listening to a sermon and I uh, was responding in prayer to a sermon. I took a little bit of time to think about what, what, what was said, what my heart was saying to God. And I realized the person that has led me thus far in life was not my parents. It was, you know, much less me. I did not lead my life so far. I had no control over my life. I knew that there was some other person that has led me thus far. There was some other person that, that has provided all the needs that I had into, in my entire life. There was a person that was in charge, who could be in charge of my life. And he was the one who was actually, who had been listening to all my prayers. He was the one who sent me all the preachers, all the sermon messages, all the Bible teachings so I could know more about him. And when I realized that he knows my past and he knows my future, and I realized that I am before him in that prayer time, I was undone, so to speak. Maybe like when Nathaniel was undone, when he realized that Jesus sees him in his most private moment. At that moment, I committed myself to Christ, saying that, Jesus, you have been the one that has leading me this time. And you have died on the cross to forgive my sins. After three days, you resurrected, even defeating, cheating death. And now you are the one, only person in this whole entire world that has the authority to lead my life. I give my life to you. When I realized that he was there, I gave my life 
to him. And this was my confession of faith. Jesus, you are my Lord. In fact, that was Nathaniel's response as he was undone before this person, this rabbi, this man of God. Let's look at how, what he, how he responded. In verse 49, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He confessed this statement of faith. A statement of faith is one concise statement summarizing what you believe who Jesus is, what you believe about who he is. And Nathaniel came to this conclusion, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Isn't this astonish astonishing confession in John chapter 1? I mean, we haven't seen all the miracles yet. He hasn't done anything. And yet, with his tender, pure heart, Nathaniel made this beautiful confession that you are from God. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God and the true King of Israel. That was his confession of faith. I believe and I pray that we all have a confession of faith sometime in our lives. Maybe it was during your time of your baptism. Maybe it was a time when you were confessing your love to Christ in a time of prayer. Maybe it was in a small group session where you confessed who Jesus was. For me, it was, Jesus, you are my Lord. This is a very important confession. Your confession of faith. You're, you're saying, Jesus, you are so, 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 and so to me. God, you are so, and so, so to me. This, these confessions of faith are like the pillars. These are our poles that sustain us when we are about to fall in the slope of faith. This is the first, first pole that uh, the Bible presents to us. When we are, we are disheartened, we are dismayed, this pole, our confession of faith, sustains us. Yes, I've confessed Jesus as my Lord. What, what uh, can Satan do to me? He is still my Lord. He is, has defeated death. What can you do to me, O oh, sting of death? We have that confidence, that, uh, that authority uh, to continue to in faith as we hold on to our confession of faith to our Lord. Confessing our faith to our Lord is like recovering your first love to Him. When was the first time that you confessed your love, your belief, your confirmation in Him? When we restore, when we hold on to those moments, that statement with intentional resolution, it will get us into, uh, help us navigate into difficult times in our lives. And that's what happened for Nathaniel. He confessed Jesus as the Son of God, the King of Israel. Which comes to our second pole of faith. And it is this. Not only do we hold on to the confession of faith to the Lord, we hold on to the promise of faith. I say this one as, together as well. Hold on to the promise of faith. Let's go back to the story. Jesus, he hears this young guy, this young man, pure heart, with, you know, uh, this aspiring life ahead of him saying that, Jesus, you are the Son of God. This is an amazing confession. Only John the Baptist had said something like this. And Nathaniel was saying this, and if you see a little kid, you know, being respectful to you, opening the door for you, saying, 안녕하세요 to you, you know, wouldn't you love them and want to give something to them and, you know, pat them or whatever? Jesus saw this guy was so precious, so, so beautiful. So Jesus wanted to bless him. He gave him a promise, his word. What did he say? This is the last verse of our passage of scripture, a very amazing verse that we never see anywhere else. Um, starting from verse 15, 50, says, Jesus answered him, because... I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he says, let's read this one together. Verse 51, together. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> right? For a Jewish person, this immediately made sense because this reference to the angel of God ascending descending refers to their patriarch of faith, Isaac. Uh, I'm sorry, not Isaac, Jacob, uh, who is called, they're called Israel. 
Remember when, when uh, Jacob, he was running away from his brother because he had wronged his brother. He was running away to, to his uh, uncle Laban's house. He was terrified. He was homeless. He didn't have any support. So after uh, days of running away, he falls asleep at this place and he uh, puts a stone as his, pillar, um, his uh, pillow and uh, he sleeps in, and he dreams. God shows him this ladder that is uh, put from the earth to the, to the heaven. It's open and he sees angels ascending and descending, ascending back and forth. And God says to, to Jacob that this is a sign for you that I will be with you. I will give all this land to you just like I promised to Abraham, you know, um, you know, and Isaac. I will give all this. You will come back to this place. This is a promise. And so God promised Jacob a tremendous blessing to be the, the <coughs> ancestor of, the descendant of faith. And uh, so when he got, got up, he realized that this was a temple of God. This is where God showed, him, showed up. And he called that place Bethel. In effect, Jesus was saying to Nathaniel, this place right here is your new Bethel. From now on, you will see the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, uh, seeing amazing heavenly things being done through Him. In fact, chapter 2, all the way to chapter 21 of the book of John, Nathaniel will witness, <coughs> sorry, Nathaniel will witness the amazing miracles, the signs, and the wonders, the teachings of Jesus that no man has ever seen. He, in fact, would experience angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And this promise, this promise of faith to Nathaniel was something that he needed in order to sustain his faith, his commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Because, you see, in chapter 1, <coughs> and um, after that, his name is never mentioned, Nathaniel is never mentioned, until we get to John chapter 21, the first verse, the last chapter of John. He's not a very significant figure, we find. We don't know what he is. not like Peter or John or James, his lesser known apostle, disciple. But what we do know is that he's been with Jesus all throughout the book of John. He's seen all the miracles, the wonders, and the teachings, and he's seen God, Jesus die on the cross, and he saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. And now he was able, to, that means that he sustained his faith. He was able to finish the journey of faith that Jesus had promised. And also, not only that, we know from church history that he died as a martyr probably in Armenia. He was uh, skinned, afraid to, you know, his skin was afraid to death. He was martyred. He was proud to be a martyr. And he was able to finish the journey of faith because of this promise of faith. Brothers and sisters, what is your promise of faith that you and I can hold on as we look into the new year, 2020? In the days of Jesus, there was no Bible. But you see, I see this Bible as a treasure book. Oh, thank you so much. As a, a treasure book of promises. All the promises are ours through Jesus Christ. That's why we call it the Old Testament, Old Testament. It is the old promises of God. New Testament is the new promises of God. And what a shame it is if we have all the promises of God and we never claim it. You know, when I was uh, moving from Texas to here like eight years ago, <clears throat> one of my, our church members, sorry, gave me a gift card, about like $100 loaded on it. And it was uh, uh, from this restaurant, this French cafe, you know, uh, you know, uh, breakfast and everything, <clears throat> very nice restaurant called La Madeleine. I don't know if you've ever been to a La Madeleine before. Pastor May knows, she's from Texas. And uh, <clears throat> so we came all the way to California and uh, wanted to, you know, go to La Madeleine. And we searched up, where is the uh, La Madeleine in this area? And the closest one was 750 miles away in Phoenix, Arizona. I had this gift card, this voucher, this promise that I could get some good food. I could not access, fly, I guess, to Phoenix to use the $100 voucher. It doesn't make sense, right? 
Well, the, the Word of God is like a gift card to us, an unclaimed gift card. It's not that we have to go to Phoenix to experience this Word of God. It is right here, right now, with us. Emmanuel, Jesus, has promised that when you uh, believe and when you obey, the, all these words will be ours. As we go into the new year, there is no way we could continue in the, the journey of faith unless we trust in the promise of God that He has for you and me. I have a very practical application that I really recommend and encourage you to follow if you can. As you finish the year, 2019, as you go into the um, new year, 2020, I want you to read your Bible with a purpose. Purpose of claiming a promise of God. God, what is your promise to me? What is that promise that I can claim and experience in 2020? As our eyes and hearts are focused on his promise, we'll be like Nathaniel, being able to, to uh, even endure the difficulties in our lives. Looking back at 2019, I have uh, claimed the promise as well. And it's this very verse that you see on the banner, uh, Romans 8, 14. Right? Uh, it, it says that, uh, you know, if, uh, whoever, if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are a son of God. And, and so I claim that verse. God, I'm a son of God. I want to experience being led by the Holy Spirit. And I could uh, testify that being led by the Spirit has been very exciting. <laughs> he has uh, granted me meetings with encounters with people I've never expected to meet. And, uh, you know, do things that I never expected to do. Uh, and bring results that I never expected at the beginning of the year. I cannot go into details because it concerns church and all that. But uh, I have experienced this promise of God. You recall the famous story of D.L. Moody, right? His famous Bible. We talk about that a lot. In his Bible, there were a lot of words, the letters saying T and P, right? He saw a promise of God. He would write T and live it out, try it out. And when he experienced that, oh, this is true, he would write a P. So his entire Bible was filled with T, P, T, P. Now I testify to you, I have written a T beside Romans 8, 14. And now I can write a P, saying that, yes, Son of God is led by the Spirit of God. And He is good. Brothers and sisters, let us claim what is rightfully yours as a son and a daughter of God. As we go into the next year, remember two things that we need to hold on to. The first is your confession of faith in Christ Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? Remember that. How he is the Savior. How Jesus Christ is the Lord. How he is our God. As we hold on to that, it gives us strength to get up even if we fall and stumble because of sin and temptation in our lives. Also, as we hold on to the promise of faith that God gives for you, to me, it gives us the focus to continue on trusting Him and finish the race that God has set before us in 2020. Hold on to the confession of faith. Hold on to the promise of faith. Let us continue and encourage one another to follow Jesus every day in 2020. And God bless us all. Let's pray.